now on to the Paget Lecture. So the Stephen Paget Memorial Lecture celebrates the life of Stephen Paget, who passionately believed that a greater understanding of physiology would lead to better medical advances. He was the founder of the Research Defence Society, which later became Understanding Animal Research. And this year, we're delighted to celebrate the 85th Paget Lecture, adding Professor Cherry Wainwright to our long and eminent list of lecturers. Cherry is the Director of the Centre of Cardiometabolic Health Research and Co-Director of the Centre for Natural Products in Health at Robert Gordon University. She's also a member of her university's AWERB. Cherry is currently Vice President Meetings for the British Pharmacological Society and within the BPS she has served on the Integrated Pharmacology and Animal Welfare Panel for several years. Her research focuses on cardiovascular disease, where she looks at the mechanisms underlying the pathophysiology of the disease, pathophysiology of the disease, <laughs> to identify novel therapeutic targets for treating cardiovascular diseases. Cherry has worked with numerous animal models throughout her career, from rats and rabbits to larger animals such as pigs and dogs. When she moved to Robert Gordon University in 2003, the university didn't actually have an animal facility so she focused on cell work. However, because the cardiovascular system is fully integrated and changes can affect the whole body, she faced limitations. So the university applied for an establishment license and Cherry got to resume in vivo work, predominantly using mice. Today, I'm delighted to introduce Professor Cherry Wainwright and her lecture, Getting to the Heart of the Matter, How Animal Research Has Helped Us Understand and Treat Cardiovascular Disease. Thank you, Cherry. Thank you very much. Um, I have to start off by saying it's an incredible honour to be invited to give this lecture today and uh, particularly when you look at the very long list of people who've been before me, this includes a number of Nobel Prize winners, so um, I'm actually quite astonished to be standing here myself. Um, for those of you who don't know where Robert Gordon University is, um, which is not uncommon, uh, it's based up in Aberdeen um, and its campus stretches approximately um, 0.9 of a mile along the banks of the River Dee, so it's a very pleasant place to work. Um, so the focus of my talk today is around cardiovascular disease and um, around 7.6 million people in the United Kingdom today are suffering from some form of circulatory disorder. And approximately three people die every minute from cardiovascular disease. Of those, around a quarter are under the age of 75. When you look at more globally, there are actually 550 million people across the world with some form of circulatory problem. And 200 million of those have coronary heart disease. So despite the fact that there has been a lot of research in the area, we are still facing a major health issue which has both economic and uh, social consequences. And what's disappointing is that the global figures um, have increased by about 93% since 1990, which is quite shocking. And that's not because of the lack of effort in trying to find out and find cures for cardiovascular disease. It's because, and I think what I'd like to try and explain to you is the complicated processes that are involved in cardiovascular disease make it very difficult to predict and to treat in some cases. Now we might regard um, CVD as a, a disease of, of modern society, but in fact, it's been around for a long time, and a beautiful study showing um, CT scans of mummies from uh, Egyptian tombs demonstrated that major arteries in the neck, in the groin, and in the, the, neck, um, the shoulder region um, showed presence of atherosclerosis. And um, a further study looking at mummies from four different uh, ancient populations showed that this Atherosclerosis is also present in the coronary arteries. And if you look at the age of the mummies, the estimated age of death, the older they were, the more of them had atherosclerosis. What's interesting about that, and we're, it, it, I'll, I'll come back to this point um, uh, shortly, is that 
um, individuals who were mummified <coughs> tended to come from the higher echelons of society and therefore would have been the ones who had the most extravagant diets, such as those rich in, in meats. The first description of a death from coronary heart disease, however, is attributed to Leonardo da Vinci, um, who witnessed the very sudden and apparently peaceful death of an elderly man aged 100 years old. And because he had special privileges as an artist, he was given permission, he was allowed to perform human dissections. So he dissected this poor unfortunate man um, and found that what he believed was the cause of death was that the blood and the artery that feeds the heart um, was very dry, shrunken and withered. And he used that privilege um, of human dissection quite a lot after that. Uh, he dissected around 22 human corpses, but also extended his studies into animals, uh, dissecting sheep, horses, birds, in fact, probably anything he could get his hands on. And from this, he created his understanding of the circulation um, by drawing very detailed anatomical diagrams. But it was a little while later that William Harvey, one of the forefathers of this great institution, um, undertook the first real studies to try and understand how everything worked together and basically identified that the heart and the circulation is, is quite a detailed uh, plumbing system. Um, and he believed that to learn was to study anatomy. And from his work, he, he managed to elucidate that, in fact, the heart is at the, the very centre of everything. And it receives blood from the venous side of the circulation, and it pumps it through the lungs for oxygenation and then pumps it around the rest of the body. And as he said, the heart of the animal is the foundation of their life. And so if the heart stops, life stops. Things took a long time to move on much further. Um, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about some very key milestones in our understanding of, of cardiovascular disease. And I'll spat, um, with a little scattering of bits of work that I have done that maybe have helped to contribute to our overall understanding. Um, but perhaps one of the, the main pioneers in, in making that link between diet and atherosclerosis was uh, Nikolai Antikov. Um, and he performed some studies in, in rabbits where he fed them certain foodstuffs such as egg yolks and found that when he took plasma from these rabbits, they had quite a high level of lipids. Um, and when he looked at the arteries from these rabbits, he found that there were fatty deposits. And he found the same thing when he fed the, the rabbits with a pure cholesterol. Um, and he then went on to study in, in much more detail about the circulation of the heart. Um, and he made some very um, clear statements and, and, and ones that still hold true today. The first of these is that um, gradual narrowing of the coronary arteries is better than a sudden thrombotic occlusion. I think that's a bit of a no-brainer, really. Um, <laughs> he also uh, did quite a lot of, of work to study the, the collateral circulation of the heart. And the collateral circulation is a, a network of blood vessels so that if, if one, we have actually only three main arteries that supply the heart muscle with oxygen. And if one of them um, narrows, then the other arteries grow little um, blood vessels to come and try and supply that, that bit of muscle that's been starved of oxygen with blood. And these are called collateral blood vessels. And he's, he identified that the collateral blood supply to the heart is of primary importance in maintaining its perfusion. He also found that narrowing of the coronary arteries is accompanied by changes in the vascular wall. So the shape and the, the, um, the, the diameter of the blood vessel changes. And this is termed today as vascular remodeling. And he also suggested that if you return blood flow to the heart, um, by um, removal of a, a thrombus in a blood vessel, then you get restoration of blood flow. So this was back in the 1960s. 
And what it led us to was this understanding that atherosclerosis results in a, a narrowed internal diameter or lumen of a blood vessel. And in the best case scenario, this results in pain of angina, which is uh, pain in the chest brought upon, upon by physical effort because the blood, the blood vessel isn't um, able to supply sufficient blood to the heart to meet the demands of exercise. Or the alternative mm. is the development of a, a thrombus if the, um, uh, the plaque breaks uh, with the catastrophic consequence of what is known as a heart attack or an acute myocardial infarction, which has two key consequences. The first of these is life-threatening arrhythmia, and the second is death of the tissue of the wall of the artery. So in order to be able to um, address this, this um, very serious event, um, we need to understand what is happening. Um, and so I'm going to start off at, with the worst case scenario um, and talk about what we know about these events and then I will move on to um, what we now know also about the process of atherosclerosis. Um, because I think it's, it, it's important that we understand the pathological mechanisms uh, of coronary heart disease to be able to identify new treatments. Um, somebody mentioned earlier on that uh, it's good to, to recognise the, the pluses and the minuses and I think the first part of my talk will perhaps be less encouraging than the second part of my talk. <clears throat> so a little lesson in cardiac electrophysiology. Um, when, basically, the, the way in which uh, the heart contracts is that there are electrical signals sent from the top, upper, um, the upper right chamber of the heart, which passes down through the, the, the wall between the two cha main chambers of the heart, and then propagate up the exterior walls of the heart. And the, the rate at which these pulses, uh, these electrical pulses, um, pass through the, the muscle determines the order of contraction. So in fact, although the, the electrical activity starts up here, it is the base, uh, sorry, the apex of the heart that starts to contract first to allow blood to pump through the uh, blood vessels. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of the early work looking at both cardiac arrhythmia and myocardial injury was performed in dogs. And the reason that this was done is because it's a large animal model, the heart is easily accessible, it's easy to visualise the coronary arteries and identify a specific point at which um, a ligature could be placed around the coronary artery to induce or to simulate uh, a heart attack and, uh, and induce a myocardial infarction. Um, and it also allowed us, uh, the measurement of um, electrical signals in both the normal and the, the ischemic tissue. Um, and you really don't need to take too much notice of these, but basically when the, a heart cell is, is activated by an electrical signal, it produces what is called an action potential that is determined by the movement of a variety of positively charged ions such as sodium, calcium, and potassium. However, when you look at the action potential that's measured in uh, tissue that is ischemic, you can see that there are marked changes. Um, and the, in particular, the action potential is shorter. What this means is that um, as um, uh, electricity is conducted down the, the walls of the heart, um, if the conduction is slowed, there is a good chance that it's going to reach a point um, that is, uh, has recently been activated to reactivate it sooner than, sooner than normal. So this is an ECG in a dog um, showing the baseline, nice, easy um, to, to record ECGs. Um, at the point of coronary occlusion, within one minute, you start to see changes in the ECG, which are due to these changes here. And within five minutes, you start to see, five to 10 minutes, you start to see extra beats. So rather than a regular beat, the, the, the heart is now going boom, 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 boom. And within 15 minutes, the whole electrical activity can get completely out of control 
resulting in ventricular fibrillation. Now, the management of these arrhythmias that occur within the first 15 to 30 minutes of the onset of a heart attack are quite difficult to manage. Um, and for a long time, they only, and, and probably still, the only approach to it was the use of antiarrhythmic drugs like uh, uh, lignocaine and verapamil, or, in the worst case scenario, <coughs> electrical defibrillation. So if the patient is uh, lucky enough to survive this, the next problem that is faced is that of the death of the myocardium. And, and um, Rima came up with a, a, a theory around the wavefront phenomenon of myocardial cell death back in the 1970s. And again, this is data obtained from dogs. And it shows that with time, um, after about 40 minutes, of lack of blood flow to the heart because of the thrombus, approximately 30% of the ventricular wall has died. Extend that to three hours, and it's over 60% of the area that's affected has died. Um, and by 96 hours, um, it's just extended a little further. And so he looked at what the possible causes and, and stages of this, this tissue death were. And in the first 40 minutes, the main things that happen is that the, the energy source in the heart, which is adenosine triphosphate, ATP, is depleted and the cells become quite acidic. <coughs> Platelets that are in the blood vessels in that part of the heart become activated and the heart throws out all sorts of stress signals um, to try and um, uh, set off a repair mechanism. Within one to three hours, so the first stage is reversible. If you restore blood flow at that point, then the heart will normally go back to normal. But if it extends to between one and three hours, we start to see irreversible injury, where the tissue becomes swollen, becomes edematous. Um, there is a massive influx of calcium, um, and the, the cells become overloaded with calcium, and inflammation is initiated. And then over the next four to 96 hour period, the cells become necrotic and die. And what that means in the, the long term is that somebody who has had a heart attack, the, the size of the dead tissue in the heart is, cannot be repaired. It doesn't repair itself. And so there is a consequent um, uh, reduction in the ability of the heart to function properly and um, in terms of morbidity, their life expectancy is going to be reduced. So that is the point at which um, the knowledge was when I started my, my research career. Um, and it kind of came about as a bit of an accident, really, because first of all, cardiovascular pharmacology was not my strong point as an undergraduate. Um, and uh, I'd, I'd actually plumped to go down the route of uh, neuro neuropharmacology. But um, then, Professor Jim Parrott from the University of Strathclyde was the external examiner for my, PH, uh, for my BSc. And um, after he, he was actually very late. He was held back coming from uh, the Middle East. And so our drivers were at 7 o'clock in the evening. Um, and um, so once we were all over, we all went to the pub, um, waiting for the secretary in the department to phone us in the pub, because, of course, there was no email in those days, no mobile phones to tell us that the results were up on the board and I got a call came out for me and I was asked to go back and to go back into the examination room and obviously I was full of trepidation uh, and Jim just turned to me and said uh, would you like to come and do a PhD with me um, and I thought hmm, okay let's give this a try <laughs> so it was a bit accidental and Jim was very interested in in uh, what are called prostanoids, um, and I'm sure you've all heard of aspirin and other non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen. And the way in which these drugs work is that they block the production um, of certain um, uh, compounds called prostanoids by blocking an enzyme uh, called uh, cyclooxygenase. And aspirin was being looked at as a possible way of treating or preventing heart attacks at the time. Um, and, uh, and so uh, Jim was particularly interested in, in the thromboxane and the thromboxane and prostacyclin because thromboxane is produced by platelets. It 
aggravates more platelets, it causes constriction of blood vessels, and therefore probably not a good thing to have in a heart that's undergoing ischemic stress. Whereas on the other hand, um, prostacycline comes from the, the cells lining the blood vessel wall, the endothelium, uh, and that is um, an antiplatelet agent and it causes vasodilatation. And what Jim found working with, uh, with Susan Coker was that <coughs> using uh, a dog model, and they, they, we actually used greyhounds, um, was that they could measure in the coronary vein, so that's the vein draining the, the part of the heart that had been made ischemic, that there was a massive increase in thromboxane within the first 10 minutes. And this was completely blocked by aspirin. Um, he managed to, they managed to show the same thing in relation to prostacycline, but as their work moved on, what they found was that it was the balance between these two that determined whether or not arrhythmias were serious. So if more thromboxane were produced than prostacycline, you saw much greater arrhythmia activity. If it was the other way around, if there was more prostacycline than thromboxane, then this seemed to be antiarrhythmic. The problem, therefore, is perhaps the use of aspirin wasn't a good idea, because by blocking both thromboxane and prostacycline, you were taking that balance away, and it might be better to shift it more in the direction of prostacycline. So my PhD um, was focused really on looking at a thromboxane synthetase inhibitor, so that is a drug that blocks only the production of thromboxane, but also as to whether or not uh, addition of a beta blocker, because beta blockers were also being trialled at the time as a means of reducing um, arrhythmia and heart injury. And so my PhD started, and it started a lifelong interaction with, in, uh, with industry because it was co-sponsored by what was then Ciba Um <clears throat> And this is the, the very first paper I produced. And up on the top here, we, we for this study, um, used a rat model. So moving away from dogs, um, for a number of reasons, um, it was very re reproducible. Uh, and obviously it was um, a lot cheaper, and, and I won't deny that that's one of the key, the key reasons for, for moving to that model. But what this shows on the top here is the electrocardiogram, and as soon as you ligate to coronary artery, you get these massive changes in, in an ECG, and five minutes later, lots of arrhythmias and ventricular fibrillation. Um, and every single one of those arrhythmias was counted, and those of you under the age of 40, will probably not know that at the time there were no computers, no sophisticated software. It meant printing off reams and reams and reams of charts and sitting and counting every single arrhythmia by eye. Um, and as you can see, over a 30 minute period, sometimes in the region of 1400 ventricular ectopic beats. Um, and what, what we found was a, a slight antiarrhythmic effect of metoprolol and thromboxane inhibition, um, uh, but nothing spectacular. But there was, with the beta blocker, and the beta blocker in combination with the, the inhibitor, the, the TXA2 inhibitor, a big reduction in ventricular fibrillation. But disappointingly, um, uh, the, the thromboxane synthetase inhibitor did not do anything on its own. I was also fortunate enough to go and spend some time working in Lajlo Sekeres's lab in Seged in Hungary, um, and Ishvan Lepran worked with me because they had a, a model using um, conscious rats where the, mm. the, the um, ischemia was induced under anaesthetic, and then after the, the, the severe arrhythmia period was over, the animals were allowed to recover. And this meant that we could look at infarct signs as well. Um, and the, the, the marked thing here is that, first of all, if you look at infarct signs after four hours compared to 48 hours, you see it's much bigger. And that ties in with that wavefront phenomenon of cell death. Um, and interestingly, at four hours, metoprolol reduced infarct signs. But after 48 hours, we weren't really seeing an awful lot. This was kind of a... Um, a pattern that happened and many people and many scientists were looking at lots of different ways to try and salvage the heart. 
Um, beta blockers, including metoprolol, calcium antagonists like uh, verapamil, and aspirin. And while animal studies tended to show that they were of benefit, um, clinical trials didn't hold this out at all. And the main reason is that in the experimental models, we were giving the drugs before the onset of the heart attack. Whereas in people, you don't know that they're going to have a heart attack. And unless you do mass dosing, then, then you're really up against it. So um, really, the, the only way forward was probably to reperfuse. Um, and so the coronary thrombolysis became the next challenge um, or, or target. Um, and thrombolysis is basically the breaking down of a blood clot. And when a blood clot um, uh, stabilizes, if you think about when you cut yourself um, and eventually a scab forms, that's because the, the blood clot has created these fibrin strands that make it nice and, and solid. Um, but after a while, you don't need it anymore. So there is a system whereby um, a, a, an enzyme called plasmin will literally cut up these fibrin strands to break up the blood clot. And so thrombolytic therapy was developed, which was based on the ability of the, um, uh, uh, the activation of plasmin using a plasminogen activator. And this gave rise to several well-known ones, such as streptokinase, urokinase, etc. And this worked very well clinically. So the first ones were done in around the late 70s. And this shows very nicely that you've got here a blocked artery in a patient before thrombolysis and then after thrombolysis, you can see that blood, is, blood flow is restored. And in terms of clinical benefit of that, um, it looked quite good. It looked quite good. Um, and this is just an example that studied nine clinical trials which um, had approximately 45,000 patients across the nine trials, total of 6,000 deaths. And they looked at the time to intervention. And if they found that thrombolysis was performed within the first six hours, mortality was reduced by 3%. Seven to 12 hours, 2%. Over 13 hours, down to 1%. Part of that could be due to the sting in the tail. And that is the fact that reperfusion, the restoration of blood flow itself, actually can worsen the damage that has happened during the ischemic period. Um, and um, uh, Bob Cloner was one of the pioneers who, who looked into, and I'll give a bit more detail in a minute, but th they showed very nicely that um, the, the microvascular reperfusion, so the the collateral blood vessels that are there to try and supply the, the heart with blood in the presence of a, um, an ischemia, actually, they, they, they close down, they block. Um, and so um, this results in what is called no reflow. And if the, after two minutes of reperfusion in, in a rabbit model, 12% um, of the area at risk had no reflow. After two hours, this increased to 30%, and after eight hours, up to 35%. So this could explain why we're not seeing on reperfusion the improvement in mortality in patients that we would hope for. And so Bob um, Cloner, along with Eugene Brunewald, developed this, this theory around um, reperfusion being a bit of a double-edged sword. So again, I don't really need you to take too much into in, um, 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 notice of, the, of, of all the, the steps in this, but under an ischemic condition, I mentioned already ATP depletion and acidosis. When you restore blood flow, you get reoxygenation and a massive return to ATP production, but what that does is it creates the production of very large quantities of what are called reactive oxygen species. So these are radicals, free radicals, that basically fly around the cells and batter holes in the membrane. Um, and one of the things that they do 
is that they cause mitochondrial damage. So the mitochondria are the respiratory powerhouse of the cell. Um, and they cause the opening of a, of a, a pore called the mit mitochondrial permeability transition pore. Um, and that leads to massive cellular damage. At the same time, the acidosis is lifted, so pH becomes normal. That results in calcium overload, and again, that contributes to, to damage. And so studies in not just dogs, but lots of other species, put together that whole concept of reperfusion injury. And in fact, in terms of what, what the consequence of that is, well, it sets off reperfusion arrhythmia, which in some cases can lead to sudden cardiac death. It causes stunning of the, 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 the heart tissue, which means basically a portion of the heart doesn't contract properly. Um, but that is a, a temporary uh, problem that eventually recovers, but it can also cause this lethal cell death. Um, and there is clear evidence that at least myocardial stunning and reperfusion arrhythmia occurs in humans, not just in the animal models, but there's also the probability that it, uh, the, the lethal cellular injury and the lack of reflow also happens. It's difficult to look because, of course, we, don't, we can't just take the heart out of a human when they've, when they've recently recovered from um, reperfusion therapy. <clears throat> so, how to tackle this? Well, the next thing that came along was a phenomenon called myocardial preconditioning. And this was first described by Murray and, and um, Bob Jennings. And it, it's defined as the ability of the heart to withstand prolonged and severe periods of ischemia after priming pr with prior periods of ischemia. And the simplest way of, of illustrating this, and this was discovered again uh, in dogs, is you just focus on the top here, which is the timeline of coronary occlusion. So this is a control group that was subjected to a 40 minute period of coronary occlusion and then four days of the blood vessel being reperfused. In the preconditioned group, they preceded that long occlusion with four one minute coronary occlusions followed by one minute periods of reperfusion. And amazingly, what this did was it dramatically reduce the, the extent of damage to the heart. And in fact, one of my first PhD students demonstrated something very similar against um, arrhythmia in rat hearts, um, showing that if you, there was an optimum time of a three minute occlusion followed by either 10 minutes of reperfusion or 30 minutes of reperfusion that's markedly suppressed arrhythmia um, but if you extended that reperfusion period, sorry, that gap between the, the priming ischemia and the main ischemia uh, to 60 minutes, you lost it completely. <coughs> so is that applicable in the clinic? Is it something that you can do? Well, um, maybe, maybe not. You need to know what's happening to understand how, you know, in giving an, uh, an insult to the heart before a bigger insult you know, what's going on? How can that happen? Well, going back to, to where I started looking at um, uh, thromboxane and prostacyclin, Jim and I were very interested in looking at whether other compounds or chemicals produced by the heart could actually be triggers of ischemic preconditioning. Um, and one uh, that we were particularly interested in was adenosine. Now, adenosine... Um, is a byproduct of ATP, and I've mentioned that a few times. ATP is the source of energy in the heart, um, and during ischemia, it is um, depleted very, very rapidly. Um, and the adenosine that is um, it's metabolized into can move in and out of the cell through a, something called a nucleoside transporter. Um, and when it gets outside the cell, it can act on certain uh, receptors and activation of those receptors causes a, a reduction in heart rate, it causes inhibition of platelets, and it causes vasodilatation. So these are the kind of activity that, that we would imagine would be protective to the heart. And I was lucky enough at this point in my career to be, um, after a very 
long seven-hour interview with Paul Janssen, was uh, awarded a, a five-year uh, research lectureship by the Janssen Foundation. And this allowed me to pursue this concept. Um, and it's at this point that we change from a dog model to a pig model. Um, not um, because of uh, anti-vivisection activity, although uh, myself and Jim were often targets um, for that, um, but principally because of um, ASPA coming in in 1986, where dogs were listed as a protected species and therefore would have had to have been uh, bred specifically for the purpose. Um, and we had historically used greyhounds and there was not going to be anywhere that was going to breed greyhounds specifically for the purpose. Also, pigs were becoming much more used as a, a, a model for cardiovascular disease because their physiology is actually much more similar to a human in terms of the heart rate, blood pressure, um, and coronary anatomy. So we, we started working with pigs and working with um, uh, uh, this very similar model of coronary occlusion, we looked at the levels of adenosine in the blood draining the ischemic part of the heart and found that it was markedly increased. So Janssen were very interested in the development of drugs to inhibit this transporter of um, adenosine so that if um, adenosine was being released from the heart, if we prevented it from going back into the cell, perhaps we could um, uh, uh, protect the heart by these mechanisms. And in fact, um, their nucleoside transporter um, inhibitor did just that. It, it reduced the incidence of ventricular fibrillation very nicely. And then when we, um, tried, uh, when we mimicked the effects of adenosine by stimulating the adenosine receptor with a synthetic compound, we similarly saw a, a marked antiarrhythmic effect. Our interest didn't just stop with adenosine. Um, uh, in the 90s, um, endothelin was uh, a peptide of great interest. And endothelin, unlike adenosine, is perhaps not a, a considered to be a good thing because what it does um, is it acts on smooth muscle cells and um, is produced in the, the endothelium, lining the blood vessels, but then diffuses to the, the smooth muscle cells underneath to cause very, very powerful uh, vasoconstriction. But at the same time, it can act on its own receptors back on the endothelium to produce um, nitric oxide and prostacyclin, both of which produce vasodilatation. So endothelin is a bit of a, an enigma in that it appears to do two different things depending on the site of action. And um, it was shown in the early 90s, and this is in, in actually in the clinic, not in an animal model, that in the, the first hour or two of acute myocardial infarction was a massive rise in endothelin in um, the, the um, blood of patients after the onset of a heart attack. And so we wanted to have a look and see whether endothelin really, um, uh, whether that may also influence the outcome of myocardial ischemia. And so the first experiments um, that we did, um, we infused endothelin at a very, very low dose, not enough to cause um, uh, much of a change in mm -hmm. blood pressure. And we found a big increase in the number of arrhythmias and in the in incidence of ventricular fibrillation. But if we pre-treated with a, a, a drug that blocked the ETA receptor, we reversed this effect. Interestingly though, when we gave either endothelin or a selective ETB activating drug as a short bolus dose before the onset of ischemia, we saw a massive reduction in the incidence of ventricular fibrillation and we went to late, went to late, uh, later went on to show that what it was doing was that it was causing mast cells to degranulate. Um, and the, the, the fact that uh, mast cells are inflammatory cells that are, are resident in the tissue, but ischemia causes the activation of um, mast cells. So if before you give, um, apply the ischemic insult to the heart tissue,
If you can uh, degranulate those mast cells, you can actually prevent arrhythmia. And we showed that by demonstrating that we could reverse these effects of endothelium by giving uh, a mast cell stabilizer, which is in fact uh, sodium promoglycate, which was originally developed as a drug for the treatment of asthma. So endothelin seems to do more, it seems to do some good things and it seems to do some bad things. And over the years, Jim, um, working with Agnes Weg in, in Hungary and myself, um, we looked at a whole range of, of natural substances that came out of the heart and found a number of them were protective, such as adenosine. He looked at bradykinin and nitric oxide. Um, and then we found that some, like endothelium, were both protective and damaging. What was interesting is that whilst that was going on, there was a lot of work going into trying to identify what the um, mechanism under preconditioning was. And it became quite clear that, in fact, a lot of what we'd been looking at were regarded as triggers of, of ischemic preconditioning. Um, there's, it's a very, very complicated pathway, which I'm not going to go into, but I think the important thing at the end here is if you, you think back to what I said about reperfusion injury, one of the key events that causes cells to die is the opening of this mitochondrial permeability transition pore, and it looks as though preconditioning actually stops that. <coughs> so, can you mimic preconditioning? It was tried in the clinic in many cases. Somebody's in getting re their, their um, heart reperfused, um, and um, uh, can you give them something that mimics the, or can trigger this preconditioning pathway? And so adenosine was tried, nitric oxide was tried, none of those worked. There are some rays of hope on the horizon, however. Um, cytosporin A is actually an inhibitor of MPTP and is showing some promising effects. Um, but most of the, the drugs that are showing some promise are things that modulate glucose, so they modulate the metabolism within the heart. Um, they um, are anticoagulants. Or interestingly, going back to um, my PhD, metoprolol. One of the interesting things about ischemic preconditioning is that you don't actually have to make the heart ischemic for it to work. So in fact, you can induce ischemia in the kidney, in the liver, even in the lower limb and it will initiate this preconditioning response. And, and in fact, lower limb ischemia has been tried in the clinic to see if that will try and, and protect the heart. Not to much great success, it has to be said. So in terms of um, whether it's clinically possible to precondition, um, then came about the, the, the concept of post-conditioning. And post-conditioning is, is really, can you induce these short periods of ischemia after you've restored blood flow? Um, and this, this study um, uh, showed quite nicely that, um, so if you've got a control uh, group where you've got a 60-minute ischemia and three hours of reperfusion, mm -hmm. preconditioning, um, uh, five minutes of ischemia, ten minutes of reperfusion before the long occlusion, or post-conditioning where you have the 60-minute occlusion followed by mm -hmm. three short ischemia reperfusion. It still protects the heart. So, where are we? Well, I did say at the start some of the news is not particularly good um, in some cases. And whilst the concept of ischemic post-conditioning seemed quite uh, optimistic, there's really only one or so studies that have shown that when you do this in patients, it actually works. Um, and so I'm not sure how far much further on we are than, than we were in terms of myocardial salvage. Um, and, and Gersh 
put this together quite nicely a, a, a number of years ago, really highlighting that the window of opportunity is extremely narrow. If you go in too soon, well, can you get to a patient that soon within the first 15 to 30 minutes? With 12-hour waiting times in ambulances in hospital car parks, probably not. If you leave it till after three hours, the damage is already done. And so you have this very narrow window of opportunity. And I'll come back to it again. And, and what really I, I find, I think maybe some of the work that I did in my PhD helped to reach this position. But basically, if, if metoprolol is given before in the clinic, if it's given before the onset of reperfusion, you get about 30% of the myocardium can be salvaged versus placebo. So uh, maybe the oldens are the good ones, um, as they say. So I want to change tack a little bit now for the, for the um, last little while. And considering the fact that 40 years in the business and I've not really seen a huge amount of progress in terms of being able to protect the heart, it's maybe better to, to take a step back and address the cause rather than the consequence um, and I also uh, I mentioned earlier about the, the, the theories behind the, the development of atherosclerosis. Um, and um, very early studies in rabbits showed that um, if you feed rabbits cholesterol, um, the, the severity of the atherosclerotic plaque is, is directly related to the amount of low density like protein in, in the blood. <coughs> and, and in fact, um, studies in, in human um, patients, um, if you look at, at, at the um, uh, levels of uh, LDL, um, of LDL, that the levels were much, much higher in patients who'd had a myocardial infarction than those who hadn't. Um, and so that gives us a good correlation between what happens in experimental animals and, and what we see in the, the clinical situation. Um, and quite how this leads to atherosclerosis, though, um, was really untangled by Russell Ross, who developed this, uh, his response to injury hypothesis. Um, and basically, what he was saying is that um, it's a bit of a, a circus movement in that um, the, the cells lining the blood vessel wall are injured in the first instance by the presence of high cholesterol levels in the blood. But that then sets off a circuit of um, repeat injury or chronic injury. So if the cholesterol remains high, then over time there's a, a massive series of events that lead to the development of atherosclerotic plaque. Um, and this is going to look very uh, busy um, but it just really highlights the complexity of what happens. Um, and so a, a key event is the oxidation of uh, LDL, which is the bad cholesterol um, in, in, um, in circulation. And when that becomes oxidized, it damages the, the cells lining the wall of the blood vessel. That then sets off a massive inflammatory response um, and that inflammatory response encourages smooth muscle cells to start to move from where they belong in the, the medial section of the blood vessel and start to move under the endothelial cell layer. At the same time, they proliferate and they start to produce um, collagen that helps keep them in place. Um, and then that leads on to the accumulation of lipids. So you get, eventually, um, a, 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 an artery that, that has these big layers of lipid pools. So what's the best way of dealing with that? Reduce cholesterol. Um, and the, the first drugs that were used were things like bile acid sequestrants, which prevent the absorption of cholesterol. But the biggest um, uh, milestone, really, was the development of the statins. Um, and they'd been around for quite a long time. They were first identified in the 1970s. 
Um, but um, they were, it took a while for them to be identified as inhibitors of this enzyme HMG-CoA reductase. And that is a crucial enzyme involved in the synthesis of cholesterol. And the liver is the, the main organ that determines our cholesterol levels. Uh, cholesterol is required. It need, we need it to feed our brains. We need it to, to um, undertake a, a, a numerous functions. Um, but the liver only produces cholesterol when it's needed. And if you've got an excess of cholesterol in the circulation, the liver goes, uh, uh, not, not making any uh, more. <clears throat> so if you can inhibit the production of cholesterol by the liver, which is what the statins do, then the, cholesterol, the liver goes, oh, I need more cholesterol now to produce bile acids and bile salts. So it produces these receptors that then suck up the cholesterol from the circulation. And the, the um, statins started being looked at and studied for um, potentially um, treatment of, of the slowing of progression of atherosclerosis First of all, largely in rabbits, because this one, the Watanabe heritable hyperlipidemic rabbit, was very prone, prone to atherosclerosis. And um, uh, statin treatment reduced um, lesions by approximately 30% um, and narrowing by 50%. And then the West of Scotland coronary prevention trial showed very clearly that if you give people uh, statins, then death from all cardiovascular causes is very markedly reduced. So statins are now in regular use in patients who have high circulating cholesterol levels. Now, just a, a little bit of variation on a statin. Um, a lot of, I, I talked about oxidation of LDL and a, a, a lot of people focus on that. But there are other ways in which LDL can be modified and become equally damaging, and that is through chlorination. Um, and there is an enzyme called myeloperoxidase that produces hyperchlorite, which is a highly reactive chlorine-containing uh, free radical. <coughs> and this can chlorinate LDL as well. And we wanted to explore this and see whether that too can encourage the process of, of ather atherosclerosis. So using um, a, a, a genetically modified mouse, the APOE knockout mouse, which is prone to atherosclerosis when fed an atherogenic diet, we fed um, these mice a, a diet. We then removed the thoracic aorta and the spleen, um, and we isolated the inflammatory cells from the spleen, which we then labelled with a radioactive label, and we exposed or treated the blood vessels with um, uh, 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 chlorinated uh, LDL and measured the adhesion to the blood vessel. Um, and what we found was that uh, the chlorinated LDL produced a very big increase in the ability of inflammatory cells to stick to the lining of the blood vessel. Um, and when um, inflammatory cells bind to a blood vessel wall, it's through certain types of adhesion molecule uh, that are expressed in response to the high, high cholesterol. Um, and one of these uh, adhesion molecules, P-selectin, we found um, was uh, responsible for this because when we blocked the P-selectin, um, the response to the chlorinated LDL was, was completely lost. And I like putting in some pretty pictures. Um, this just goes to show, this is the, the lining of the uh, blood vessel wall. Those are the endothelial cells. No P-selectin, treat it with uh, um, chlorinated LDL and you get lots of expression of P-selectin. We then started doing some work with a company called Nicox, who were producing a, um, a, a, a novel version of pravastatin, which is one of the most commonly used statins today, called nitrated pravastatin. And basically, they stuck um, a, an extra chemical group on the structure that meant that um, it released nitric oxide uh, in addition to blocking the, the enzyme. And so we took this into the model I've just described to you, 
Um, and in some of the mice, we then gave them NO pravastatin or pravastatin for five days before we isolated the blood vessels um, and their monocytes. And what we found was that uh, while pravastatin didn't really itself prevent the adhesion of inflammatory cells, if you had a nitric oxide donating part to the chemical structure, then you had, um, a, we could see a big reduction in adhesion. Um, and likewise, um, it was able to prevent um, the adhesion induced by um, chlorinated LDL. Um, that compound has been through quite a lot of other trials. It's not made it to anywhere to um, uh, the clinic as yet, but I do think that it is um, a, a real opportunity um, for building a, sort of bifunctional molecules um, having two different mechanisms of action. So, <clears throat> moving on for the very last part of my talk, um, in terms of atherosclerosis, um, the, in addition to prevention, then the treatment is also very important. Um, and uh, Dotter and Grunzig um, developed the, the process of angioplasty, which I'm sure many of you heard about, which involves progressing a wire down the coronary artery um, to the point of a lesion, inflating it to break it up, and therefore revascularizing or re restoring blood flow. Um, uh, but at the same time as with reperfusion injury, there's a bit of a sting in the tail, and that is um, previously um, uh, angioplasty bits of artery can often uh, re-narrow, and this is termed restenosis. Um, and so um, the colleagues that I'd worked with at Sibagaygi many years before, um, and Sibagaygi had now become Novartis, came to me and said, we'd like to do some work with you, but we want you to work on blood vessels, and would you be interested in restenosis? And I said, well, let's give it a try. So we, we started by developing a, a model in rabbits, um, looking at the response to this balloon injury, and did very much a time course study of, of the variety of changes in the blood vessel wall. And about two days after the balloon angioplasty, this was in a subclavian artery of the rabbit, uh, about two days afterwards, you get what is called vessel shrinkage or recoil, where the, 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 the blood vessel kind of reacts to the, the overstretch by shrinking down. And then over seven days, um, the blood vessel starts to change in shape um, and the walls become thicker. And we get what is called the formation of a, a neo intima. So that's a normal artery, and that is an artery that's been balloon injured, and that's the uh, tissue that's grown into it. And when we stained for inflammatory cells, we found that there was quite a lot of inflammation present in, in these artery walls. So to demonstrate that uh, inflammation was important in the process of restenosis, we, we took some rabbits and we made them leukopenic by using um, an antigen to a leukocyte com mm -hmm. uh, common antigen, which we gave prior to the angioplasty procedure um, so that their, their um, uh, leukocyte count was, was almost zero. Um, and then we performed the angioplasty and we found that compared to control animals with a full complement of inflammatory cells, when we made them leukopenic, they were, um, the, the size of the, the neo intima was markedly reduced and that just shows you the difference between the, the two groups. However, making patients leukopenic is probably not a very good idea. Um, so the other thing that we needed to target was the proliferation of smooth muscle cells, which uh, predominantly um, make up this, this neo intima. Um, and so we were interested in trying to look at, at drugs that would do this. Um, and anti-cancer drugs are anti-proliferative. They prevent the proliferation of, of some muscle cells. And so we came across one compound that, that acts as an, an inhibitor of an enzyme called farnesyl transferase, um, which was going through trials uh, as an anti-cancer agent. Um, and we asked the question, could we prevent smooth muscle cell proliferation with this drug? 
And, and rather than giving the drug systemically, we opted to use a special balloon with pores in it so that we could bathe the, the, the piece of artery that was being angioplasted with the drug rather than having to give it systemically. Um, and what we found is when we administered this Farnesour transferase inhibitor through a balloon cap at the, um, in the balloon catheter, this is using a pig model in this, in this occasion, the pig coronary artery, we got a massive reduction in injury in response to FPT3. At the same time, coronary stenting was becoming a particularly um, common way of trying to address particularly the shrinkage of the blood vessel after angioplasty. Um, but the problem with it is that you put the stent in, you get a good response in the first instance, but again, as time goes on, the tissue begins to grow around the, the metal stent. However, we managed to demonstrate with our FPT3 that even in the presence of a stent, we could reduce the amount of neointimal formation. And to give it a translational slant, we, we managed to obtain um, human arteries from amputated limbs by working with uh, vascular surgeons. Um, and we could show that if we took rings of the uh, oh, arteries from uh, human patients, put them into organ culture, we get the same kind of growth of neointima and that we could prevent that with FPT3. And we got to the point of um, putting in a, a patent uh, to protect this um, and then along came two drugs that were already in the market for other uses as anti-cancer agents, very quick to repurpose. And these were paclitaxel and sirolimus or rapamycin. Um, and um, they made it very, very quickly into the clinic. Sorry, paclitaxel works very much in the same way as our <coughs> compound did. Sirolimus has both anti-proliferative and anti-inflammatory actions. Um, and both um, are uh, used to a great extent. Interestingly, I came across this the other day. In the 2022 to 32 uh, projections, coronary stents, our market uh, value is expected to reach in excess of $50 billion. So big money. And we missed out. <laughs> <coughs> Very last slide, really just to say that I've talked a lot about understanding the pathology of disease as a way of identifying in how we can treat disease, in some cases successfully, in other cases not. But sometimes we learn things the other way around, and, and we were interested, I developed, um, I do quite a lot of work in cannabinoids, and we were interested in cannabidiol, which I'm sure many of you will have heard of, CBD, people buy it on the internet and use it for reasons I don't think they really know. Um, but it is um, quite a powerful drug and we used um, CBD in our rat model of coronary occlusion and reperfusion and we found that it was really good at reducing infarct size. Now CBD is actually quite a dirty drug, it acts on various receptors um, and one receptor in particular it's quite powerful at is an orphan receptor called GPR55. Um, and um, GPR55 is still a bit of an enigma. Um, and I was discussing this with a guy called Peter Greasley from AstraZeneca, uh, as you do in the bar after a long day at a conference. And we were talking about this data. And he said, oh, we're interested in GPR55. We've got some mice that don't have the receptor. Would you like them? He said, yes, please. Um, and so that started off a whole program of, of research that is perhaps more reflective of what I've been doing more recently. Um, and um, we found that if you stimulate GPR55 with its natural ligand, which has been now identified as LPI or lysophosphate tylenositol, you can actually worsen cardiac injury. And that supports this story about CBD, which is an antagonist of GPR55 as being protective. 
Um, but it goes further than that because we actually now know that this receptor is very important in um, a lot of things. These mice, with age, develop cardiac dysfunction. So as they get older, their ability of the heart to contract is decreased and the ability to respond to um, stimulation by um, uh, isoprenaline is reduced. They're also obesity prone. If you feed them a high fat diet, they blow up like little balloons. They're also very lazy. They don't move around an awful lot. Um, and working with colleagues at Dundee, Harry Hundall, um, we found that they have quite abnormal insulin signaling in both the fat and the skeletal muscle. Um, and a recent study that we, the, the data is not published yet is that, in fact, in, in the um, me metabolic tissues, like fat and skeletal muscle, if you activate GPR55 chronically, you get an improvement in insulin signaling. On the contrary, on the contrary however, we, we're finding that it impairs cardiac function. And I think the, the really important story there is that everything is interlinked. Um, and what's good for one setting might not be good for another. And so it's really a few take-home messages the cardiovascular system is, is integrated, it's fully integrated, the heart, the blood vessels, the, the components of the blood that circulate within that system all talk to each other. The regulation of the cardiovascular system is achieved by the brain and take chemicals that circulate around in, in the blood and it can communicate with other organs and vice versa. Coronary heart disease is really complex and it's a multi-organ condition and conditions that primarily affect other organs can also, such as diabetes, can affect the, the health of the heart. I've concentrated on animal work that I've done. I've, we also do a huge amount of, of cell-based work that leads up to working within the animals. But although isolated cells can tell us a lot, um, to understand a complex system like this, it is absolutely essential to be study, able to study it in the whole animal. Before I go, I, I think I just need to say a big thank you, particularly to the army of PhDs and postdocs that have worked with me over the years, but the countless academic collaborators, too many to name, so I've just put up their institu some of the institutions. I've worked with a lot of industrial collaborators and received very generous funding from uh, a number of um, charitable organisations as well as the research councils. Um, and I'd be delighted to answer any questions if you've got the energy left and aren't too desperate to get to the drinks. <laughs> Thank you so much for a fascinating talk. Um, we do have a couple of minutes, I'm sure, for questions. There are burning questions. I thought there would be. <laughs> Mike, um, we've got a microphone coming. Yes, I'm sorry. I think I've talked a bit longer than I should have. Uh, thanks very much. Really interesting talk. Really enjoyed it. You seem to use rabbit models quite a lot. I was just wondering why that is. Uh, not so much now um, as as back in the probably 80s and 90s. Rabbits are actually a really good model of atherosclerosis. They're a bit like some of... You, you feed them cholesterol and they will develop atherosclerotic lesions. Um, there are other... There are genetically... Um, not genetically modified, but genetic strains of rabbits, like the, the uh, Watanabe one that I've mentioned, and we also worked with a, a fox field rabbit, and they show demonstrated atherosclerosis. Quite why rabbits are so prone, I don't know. But now we have um, models, small rodent models. Uh, rats are resistant to atherosclerosis, pretty much. You can feed them cholesterol, but they won't develop atherosclerotic lesions. But if you use something like the APOE knockout mouse or the LDL knockout mouse, feed them cholesterol, you've got atherosclerotic lesions everywhere. So 
yeah, it's just again variation in species, and that's what we need to be careful about: is how you can extrapolate that to humans. Thank you, Chris. I think you had a question. Uh, let me know if you can't hear me behind the mask. It was a really fascinating lecture. Thank you. Um, I was reading recently in the media that uh, HDL might not be the good cholesterol that we thought it was. Is there any good? Is there any good news? Is there a hope uh, that there is good cholesterol? I mean, it's it. it it's more about the ratio between HDL and LDL that's been of, of interest. Um, so you can have high LDL, but if you have high HDL as well, then the, it's the ratio that's more important. So um, yes, I think there is a, a bit of bad press around a, HDL, um, but um, I think for now, trying to get the balance in the favour of HDL is, is better than, than leaving it... Um, as, as is. Yeah, thank you. That was uh, absolutely fascinating. Given that you've very clearly stated the need to look at these things on a whole system basis, how are you approaching the three R's in relation to uh, the pharmacology and uh, cardiovascular disabilities? Okay, that's a really good question, and I, I didn't really have chance to um, uh, to address that. But um, we take a very measured approach. Back in the day, you know, there was no cell-based studies that we could really use, and so everything went straight into v into in vivo. But now we have so many tools to hand in terms of uh, cell-based studies. And um, the last slide I showed, well, one of the last ones that I showed with human. Um, uh, blood vessels that we, we kept in organ culture. We, we actually have done that with, with pig coronary arteries and, and mouse arteries we, and, and, and so on. So if we're going to do any form of intervention, drug intervention, then we, we do all the um, build-up to the work so that we know what concentrations we're looking for and so on and so forth. To, to help reduce and, and good statistical and experimental design. And, and one thing that we're doing at the moment is um, the, the influence of, of um, biological sex on the outcome and on, and on, on uh, pathophysiology is highly important. And so historically, while we tended to use male of the species, we now um, are using both males and females. And then finally, um, the one thing that we have been, we have done, is uh, looking at non-mammalian models. So one of the things that we're interested in, it's maybe not qu quite so easy to look at cardiovascular physiology, but um, the C. elegans worm, for example, we've started using as a, a model of obesity. And so if we're looking, we've been looking at compounds that interfere with um, the development of um, uh, fat deposition. Um, and so, yeah, we've got some really nice data just about to come out um, looking at C. elegans. So, yes, I, I, I fully appreciate and I fully support, you know, the three R's and do what we can. At the end of the day, there are certain things that we cannot look at without the whole animal. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, you started off by saying that there is a great deal of patients out there with cardiovascular disease. Numbers are extortionate and really amazing. Um, what is the position of clinical trials um, if you look at your cell systems and your animal models? Um, how do you see that in using clinical trials, patients, and how that relates to um, coming up with solutions to this disease. Okay, I mean, clinical trials are carried out generally when you have an, an, an intervention that you have shown that in all likelihood there is a chance of getting um, a good clinical outcome. Um, but the cost of clinical trials is absolutely enormous and the number of compounds and interventions that fail before they reach the clinical stage. It could be that in, in the laboratory animal it is looking absolutely superb, 
and then he goes through regulatory toxicity testing and he discovers that the drug maybe hits um, uh, the Herc channel, for example, which is, is one of the you know, very important screens for drug safety because that can lead to um, um, a cardiomyopathy. So you might have the perfect compound and it fails because it, it blocks that channel. So the, the, the process of developing a medication is a long, arduous one and more potential compounds will, or interventions will fail before they even get to the clinic. And once they do get to the clinic, then you're relying really on being, you know, you're trying to translate what's been found in, in an animal model, usually relatively healthy, to sick people probably with multiple comorbidities. So it's, it's all we can do, all the animal work I think can do is inform us about what's going wrong, identify what we should be targeting, um, but it's not going to guarantee a positive clinical outcome. I don't know if I've answered your question properly there. <laughs> Thank you. As a non-scientist, I find that quite accessible and really grateful. If you were visiting a relative in a heart unit and it happened to buy luck to be one that's well-funded and well-staffed in these challenging times and you develop symptoms of a heart attack, what would you ask the staff to do? <laughs> if I develop them or the, or the um, me, um, <laughs> if I was conscious and able to speak, um, I would probably ask them to get me into a cath lab as quickly as possible so that they could have a look and see. Uh, well, first things first, you know, they do various blood tests to, to look at things like CK levels and, and so on. But, you know, I think if I was fairly sure I was having a heart attack, I would want to get straight into that cath lab and be uh, uh, reperfused as soon as possible because time is of the essence. I read um, fairly recently that actually plant steroids aren't great news either, and that statins don't have any effect on plant steroids, and that switching from butter to margarine might not be the right thing to do. Um, is that just being controversial, or does that theory have legs? Not being completely familiar with the topic, I can't say either way, but I think it may well have some legs. You know, there's um, the very first study I talked about was egg yolk. You know, egg yolks were used to, to feed rabbits. Um, and so for many, many years, we were told to steer clear of eating too many eggs because of the fact that they could raise your cholesterol levels. And now we're told to eat eggs because they're really good for us. So I think there are things that, that, that come, and, uh, come and go. Um, and the, the plant sterols, I mean, it, it's because you've got your monounsaturated, polyunsaturated and saturated fats. And in some of these butter substitutes, the, it, it, it's not enough of the polyunsaturated fatty acids that are there. It's, there's probably monounsaturates that probably aren't particularly good for you either. So I think, I think we're sold a lot of um, hype sometimes by the food industry. And I think um, some of the... the um, drinks that are suggested to lower cholesterol I have my doubts about but I won't name any for fear of them. You mentioned drink just then. <laughs> <laughs> are there any other questions? I can be found by the yeah. wine. <laughs> um, I'd just like to thank you all for coming. I'd like to thank all the entrants, um, including the shortlisted entrants. I know it was hard for the judges to come to the decisions they did, so please have a look at all the shortlisted entrants that are des uh, described in the, the um, programme, that's the word. Congratulations again to the winners, and thank you very much again, Cherry Wainwright, for a fantastic lecture. Thank you. Everybody.